pound camera cases. Um, <laughs> from <laughs> Cave It. Um, <laughs> and with my extra lens. Um, <laughs> and then, so that's that. Um, and then this is my truck meet uh, Yuri. Um, he's from Slovenia, 34. Um, he used to climb the Alps when he was at home when he goes back. He goes back there, he does sometimes. Um, so he's pretty experienced compared to a lot of the people we met on the trail. Um, he kind of knew what he was doing. Um, and he lives in Singapore now, and he's the, the head pilot on a, a biz jet company that flies billionaires around the world, which is interesting. Um, so this is our guide, Don. Uh, we actually had another guide originally when they picked us up at the airport and they switched us out for this guide, um, uh, which I think was pretty nice because he was uh, more experienced. Um, and uh, he was born in Kathmandu, um, and he worked up his way from being a porter, um, and he carried uh, almost 100 pounds on his back because they would do tenting trips. They didn't go to the lodges like we did, um, and he carried them, and then he worked up being a, an assistant guide, and now, now he's uh, one of the head guys of the company I live with. Um, and, yeah, so, and he's pretty happy. He likes laughing. So, um, and this is our porter. Um, I never actually caught his name. He was super quiet. Um, and he usually didn't hike with us. He was usually, he would leave ahead of us or he would be hiking behind us um, and he'd kind of go hang out by himself. Um, but he was 15 years old, um, which is a little crazy, um, but that's what they do. Um, and, uh, and he wants to be a climbing guide and so he has to start out. And so Madon's helping him kind of get into it like um, Madon's uh, kind of first did. Um, so, but our, our, we tried to keep as much stuff with us in our big pack so his stuff wasn't as heavy. Um, and Yuri actually didn't bring his climbing gear, he rented it when we got there, um, so he didn't have to carry it the whole way. Um, but it was probably 60 pounds that he carried, um, plus his uh, backpack, which was on top there. Um, we had doubles. Um, so, but, and we did give him a big tip. So. Um, but yeah, so then this is our first day. We were waiting at the airport. Um, we're trying to get you know, on the plane into the mountains. Um, there was about 15 flights, I think, scheduled for the, the first day when we tried. Normal, and then, like, the, the normal season, there's about 50 flights because of all the people going in and out. Um, and, of course, because of the weather, because it was starting to be monsoon season, it got canceled. And uh, so that's our rain cloud there. But we sat there for about six hours, and then we went back to the hotel. Um, and then uh, this is driving back. Um, and uh, so this is the old. Uh, King's Palace. Apparently, he didn't like it and made a new one somewhere else. Uh, the new guy, um, but they still guard it. And then there, there's kind of a good picture of how many motorcycles and stuff there were there. It was super crowded. Um, horns are definitely used as a tool, um, which is way different than from here. Um, they use them whenever they're going past somebody to alert them, you know, that they're there. Um, and we'll, I, our driver was uh, skilled and scary at the same time about going into the other lane to pass all these big trucks and stuff and. I guess where we were going faster, um, but it was it was definitely interesting. And our guide would not drive; um, he didn't want to, so they had specific drivers. Um, but yeah, so then we got back to the hotel, and there was suddenly a hole in the street, um, <laughs> <laughs> which happened in the six hours we were gone. Um, and then <laughs> it, it was pretty long too. And then by that night, it was all covered up, and they had all those pipes in the ground and everything. So they're very efficient. There. <laughs> and, uh, so then we decided to go for a walk um, to some of the, the shops and stuff just to look around. Um, and down at the bottom, that's kind of the, the kind of big main squares um, shop. Um, and they, all that stuff there, they would pack it into crates every night. Um, it's all sitting outside, and they pack it all up except for the masks in the background. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was pretty interesting. We all passed at night. Um, and then this is their interesting power system. You can kind of see some of the other um, pictures. We saw them adding a new wire to it. They were on a, a, le a ladder leaned up against some of the poles, and they were just like throwing some new cords on there. Um, and so it's a little scary, but uh, most of the time you just high enough off the ground. Um, the <laughs> <was up. laughs> and then, uh, I assume this is from the earthquake. Um, there's a couple of buildings that we weren't quite sure. You know, they 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 were just kind of like that. Or, some of them would have like the main structure and not have sides, and we don't know if they were new or um, been in the earthquake. Right? But um, there wasn't a lot of stuff that we saw that was torn down, actually. Um, at least where we went. Um, and yeah, so then we tried again the next day, um, and uh, we waited for another six hours until noon, um, and uh, they canceled our flight again. Uh, 
or they can't see it super well. Um, and so we waited around, and then the other group that we were kind of waiting with was told that they could get a helicopter flight, um, which we had also been told, um, but we knew it was going to be really expensive, and they had a bunch of people, so it would have been cheaper for them. Um, and then, so we tried to get our own helicopter flight, and it was this whole hassle, uh, but we ended up getting a helicopter flight, and they didn't, because there was only two of us, and their other helicopter was stranded at the airport because the battery died. So we were on the rescue mission to go rescue the other helicopter so we could come back down and get the other people. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, we got in our helicopter, um, and uh, we went around a little bit because they had to set it all up, and it was uh, us, the pilot, and then two engineers, or uh, mechanics, that were coming with, um, and the like 100 pound battery or whatever it was. Um, it was really big. Um, and uh, so then we waited around a little bit more, and the helipad is next to this crash, uh, Turkish Airlines uh, 7, or no, it's an Airbus 300, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it crashed at one point because they couldn't see the runway, and so now they're taking it apart, um, and it was like a million dollar, one year old plane, and, or a hundred million dollars. But yeah, so we got to walk under that and kind of see it from the inside, so that was kind of cool. Um, and then, this is our uh, pilot, uh, Soda Gaochun, um, and this is from his Instagram page, but that was the first time that he landed um, at Everest Space Camp. Um, and nowhere else in the world do they fly like above, I don't know, like 10,000 feet. Um, but these guys, they can take their helicopters up to about 23,000 feet. Uh, the highest rescue I think ever was at 21,000 feet, um, which is pretty crazy because there's not very much air out there. But uh, they're, so they're really good. He went to the Philippines to get his you know, training, and then he came back here, and he's from Nepal. Um, and so he was a really cool guy. So, um, and then this is taking off from Kathmandu.
one point this year, yeah. or last year when they were doing like the rescues and stuff, um, they had sev seven helicopters all parked there at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they did, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah. So we had to go down into it. And apparently, when they're when they're doing a rescue and they really need a helicopter up there, the, the river is down below us, and they'll fly 10 feet above the river all the way up the canyon as far as they can go to try to go if they need to rescue somebody. Um, and they'll they'll literally be, you know they'll, they'll just follow the river right up um, until they can, um, which is um, very scary. From what? Yeah. Your age as a pilot um, didn't even like that flight. So, um, yeah, because we were going through some of the, the valleys that, the, that we went through, there was no light from the other side. And so, obviously, because Sovit does that every day pretty much, she knows that there's nothing there. But if you have never done it before, it's kind of scary. Uh, I, of course, had no idea what was happening. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, then, so we landed here. Um, that's the tea house. We, we stopped there and we had tea. And we were waiting to see if maybe it would clear up. Um, we could fly up with the helicopter uh, to Lupa, um, but it ended up just coming down and getting more and more cloudy. Um, so they had to go get a porter to carry the battery up in the other helicopter. Um, and uh, so we got all our bags on and we started um, hiking up. We actually, he actually uh, called our porter that lives in Lupa, um, and uh, he ran down to us uh, in like 20 minutes, and it took us an hour to hike back up. Um, <laughs> and he literally came running down the hill. Um, and he threw out our bags and we all walked up and we actually walked past Lupa. Yeah, so that's where the airport is supposed to be. You know? um, we actually walked past it and we went to our first um, uh, lodge for the night because um, uh, Lupa is a little bit higher than the actual trail. Um, so this is where we stayed the first night um, and all the way up there's uh, bunches of lodges at each town um, and our guide company just kind of chose the ones that seemed to be the right distance because um, we were slowly acclimatizing. So you didn't want to go too uh, um, fast up the hill, but you still wanted to go fast enough that it didn't take forever. Um, and uh, so we stayed here for the night, um, and that's my sleeping bag. And you just kind of unfolded your stuff all over the room, and hopefully it would dry. And, um, and this place didn't so much because they didn't have a heater. Um, and uh, <coughs> real quick, so this is when we started having the food. Um, most of the time, I would eat something with potatoes or dal bok, which is what they eat there every meal, uh, which is rice with uh, curry. Um, and depending on where we were, it changed. Sometimes it had potatoes in it, sometimes it was cabbage or carrots, or um, it, it changed all over. And they also had this uh, kind of like crunchy pita bread. Um, and uh, I don't have a picture of it, actually, because I ate it like um, 20 times. But uh, yeah, so then we had a lot of hot tea. Um, we usually had about five cups a day, um, just because they were boiling, so we didn't have to purify the water. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so that was what they drink there too. So that was black tea and sugar. Um, and then this is outside of the wash, um, just leaning around a little bit. And all of these buildings, they make by hand. They they get these rocks and they'll chisel them down and um, fit them together. Um, we saw some of that happening in a couple different places in the street. Amazing. Um, and then along the trail. Um, until we got too high, it got really expensive. I would have mango juice every time we stopped because um, I really like mango juice. But when it, took, it started being like five dollars per bottle, and that bottle, it looked really big, but the bottle was like that tall. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so, but, so then this is hiking up um, uh, the next day, um, and uh, we packed packed these donkeys on the trail or on the bridge. Um, we had to you wait for them to go past because they won't stop for you. <laughs> so, and on the way down, we actually follow donkeys across a bridge, um, but they're all very unsteady, and so the whole bridge was waving back and forth because they kept walking side to side, and uh, so that, that was really scary, actually. Um, but yeah, so, and a lot of them, the, the first one usually in the, the train of donkeys would have some headdress. Um, but yeah, so then this is walking up more, and this is kind of the first mountain we saw here um, that wasn't covered in trees. There's a lot of these little bridges and stuff, and um, there's about 50% of them would have water into them or something. Um, and uh, all of this is coming down from um, near Everett. Um, 
and then there was the prayer wheel that's going all the way up. The, this is a really big one. There's a lot of them were little ones that were multiple of them, um, and you always spin them clockwise as you walk past. There was more donkeys. Um, this is when we're so we're going to Namche Bazaar, which is kind of the uh, big city um, up in the mountains, um, and they all, all the other towns will go there for market day. Um, and uh, so there's full outdoor gear shops and everything there, um, and all of it has like these kind of cobblestone um, streets and stuff for the most part. Um, and uh, yeah, so then this is a waterfall that was near Namche and Leia. Um, and I think this is a little lower, but we're going back down. Um, and you went up and down a lot, going up and down near the river and then back up the other side. Um, but, yeah. So, and, oh, yeah. Quick question, was this, you, you, the, your tour guides, you were the only person on this tour? Uh, so it was me and Yuri. Um, and we were the only two people because we were climbing all Island Peak also. Um, they max will allow them a group of four, and because we were starting to be in the off season, there was only two of us. So it was us, our porter, and our guide. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was pretty nice. And there was you know, a lot, not a lot of people on the trail. I guess during the Everest season, there's you see people everywhere. Um, we saw maybe one other group of people every day. Um, so how far do you have to walk from where you landed in your helicopter? To here. The whole thing there and I peak and back was 75 miles over like 15 days. So, but we went up from 8,000 feet to 20,000 feet. So, <laughs> um, but, so these are more steps there. Um, and then this is Mount Jay Bazaar. Um, and pretty much all of these are lodges because a lot of people will go up there um, and maybe not hike past that. Um, or, you know, they just kind of hang out here for the experience. and. Um, so uh, this is the big city, and then uh, after this, this is what it used to look like in 1972, um, which wasn't that long ago, um, when, when you know, they kind of first started being commercial with the Everest expedition, um, and there was, you know, these are all just houses, you know, it's not quite as helpful. But, so then this is the cider lodge, um, and a lot of them were just kind of like this, they, they just kind of had wood paneling. Um, they'd have a lot of uh, tables, and then you can't see super well, but around the outside of the whole thing, they would have bench seats. Um, and when all the rooms are taken, the guides and the porters sleep out there on the bench seats, but they also have the heater in the room, um, and so they, you know, they, it's not a bad situation. Um, a lot of the times, I guess, in, like before 2000, the porters wouldn't even get to sleep inside the lodges, um, so it's changed a lot. Um, but, and this is my wad of money um, because the Napoli's rupee, um, 10 Napoli's rupees is one cent. And so each of these hundred uh, or thousand uh, rupee bills is worth $10. And that's the biggest denomination they have. And so you had to carry a lot of them. Um, and uh, so I have some in the back that you can look at. Um, but, and they don't have coins because they're not worth anything now. Um, but that's just kind of random. But, uh, so then this is when we hiked up above um, Namche Bazaar. We were doing uh, acclimatization. Um, and uh, this is the statue of Tenzin Norge, who was the Sherpa who helped um, Edmund Hillary when he first summited Everest. Um, and Everest is just here in the background. So, pretty far away. It, it looks kind of tiny compared to some of the other ones. Um, but uh, this is us looking down um, into the city. Um, and when we were looking at that statue was actually over here, so they hiked up farther. Um, and we're going up about a thousand feet above the town um, to be acclimatized and come back down. Uh, this is the uh, lodge that was up on top. Um, we sat there and we had TV or TV tea, um, and I made a time lapse, but for some reason that one didn't work. So, um, yeah. but uh, and then this is Everest again in the background here, um, and there it is again. Mm. And it was nice and clear as we were walking up, um, and uh, this was one of the best pictures we got up there. It was views, um, so but just pretty spectacular looking. So, um, and this is over here is Amma Guang. Uh, Everest is over here, um, and this is the much shorter peak. I believe it's like 24,000 feet, uh, but it's much more technically difficult than Everest. Um, and so this is actually the one of the it's like the second hardest peak in the world behind K2. Um, 
because you have to do actual climbing and stuff um, with, with uh, ice axes. Um, so, yeah, so both of our guides, when we went on our trip, I actually found it in the home well. So that was some of the um, And then the next day, we were going to hike over here, which is the Tango Chain Monastery, um, which looks pretty far away. And, uh, I think it took us about five hours. Well, then this is us hiking back down. And, uh, it's not super exciting, but um, on the way up, we were actually walking up with all those kids going to school. Um, because once they get above fourth grade, I think it was, their school is up on the mountain. All the little kids go to school in town. Um, and uh, so they were walking up, and they were all running past us, you know, and giggling at us. <laughs> <laughs> And there was this one little kid that was like five or something, and he ran way ahead of all of them, and then started, we think he was like joking at them or whatever, and, but yeah, it was pretty fun. So, and then this is when we're back in town, walking around a little bit, um, and uh, there's a lot of shops, um, you know, with gear and stuff you might forget, and water, because um, all, the, all the water, if you don't purify it, you buy it all the water, and as you went up the hill, um, it went from about a dollar a bottle up to about five dollars the water and they're leaders so they're big but um, so I ended up purifying my water almost every place um, just because it was cheaper um, and I you know, didn't have to carry the bottle with me. Uh, I think this is an outhouse but I'm not sure it's kind of cool picture. Um, and then, so this is trekking into Tango Che which is in that other picture of the monastery um, uh, which is up at 12,000 feet. Uh, this is when we stopped for lunch on the way um, and uh, we just kind of sat here and hung out this is looking back at Nam Chase up behind here. Um, and then we packed some yaks on the trail. Um, and apparently the ones that actually carry uh, loads are actually called cats, because um, they're cows breeded with yaks, because um, they, they do better, I guess. Um, and they only use the actual yaks for the, the milk and the wool. Um, so we saw some of both, though. We, uh, I think there's another picture that shows they're, they're a little bit more fluffy. Um, but then we got to Tingo Che and it was really cloudy again. Um, and uh, you can kind of see one of the cows out the window here. Um, but and then we also had our tracker the whole time, um, which uh, Yuri had gotten um, from his company. And so that was pinging our data so my family and some other people were watching us walk along the trail. Um, but that was just, we had to set it by a window or push outside every night um, so it would sink up. And then this is in the morning when it cleared up a lot, and we were going to head up to Dingloche. Um, and this is the inside of the lodge, and they actually have two heaters. Um, so after this point, they started having heaters, um, which they didn't use usually. Um, but sometimes we would ask them to turn it on so we could dry our clothes mostly. Uh, it didn't get too cold really, um, most of those places. But uh, we actually they turned on this one here um, in our loft and. Uh, in this lodge, and we were upstairs, and so the pipe went right through our room, so it was really warm that night. <laughs> but yeah, so, and then this is when we get to the Ingoche, um, and uh, there is this dog who followed us most of the way, I don't know, the last couple miles or so, um, hanging along with us. And, uh, we had one of those dogs, most of the way they would switch off. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, once they got to somebody else's territory, they would turn around and go back and find somebody else. Um, but so this is our uh, lodge here, or our room, um, and uh, the ceiling painted, and this is the only room that had a mirror, um, which was kind of scary, especially when we came back down. Um, but, uh, and then the bathroom was also connected, the only other one that had the connected bathroom was the, the first thing. Um, usually they were in a, a, they were, there was one per floor, um, and we never had one outside. And then this was Yuri, who was sunbathing. Um, because we, we got there pretty early. We tried to get up when we left, usually about 8 o'clock in the morning, and got to most places by like noon or 1 each day. Um, and then the other group that was kind of following us, they would usually get up and leave at like 11 and not get there until like 4. And um, it would rain on them every day. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure why they wouldn't get up earlier. But, um, and then just looking out, this is one of their potato fields here in uh, Dingboche. 
Um, and you can kind of see it down the darker part down there. Um, that's when they're, they're cleaning out everything. So each individual potato plant, they would go and they would clean out any weeds or anything that were growing around it. And by the time that we came back down from the mountain, they had cleaned the whole field, um, which was like six days, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so this is looking at the capacity. So this is my time lapse of one of the guys doing it. <laughs> But they would have baskets and they'd throw whatever they didn't like in the, in the basket. So, but <coughs> interesting thing. So, yeah, this is when we woke up in the morning. Um, that cloudy picture of before, that's what was hiding behind it. Um, and it's kind of interesting in the morning, everything would clear up and it would be really cool um, because you couldn't see it when you got there. Um, and then this is looking off kind of the side of it too. I don't know if there's any of these things here, but, uh, and then this is looking up the valley, and this is actually Island Peak here that we climbed, um, so it's straight up the valley here. We actually went around to the other side, um, and around, and that's where Everest is, so this is on the opposite side, um, so we went up to Everest Base Camp first, and then we came back around, um, down to Dango Che, and up, back down to Peak, um, and, uh, yeah. So, and then this is our acclimatization day, um, here, and, uh, we hiked up, so this is the town down here, our, our hotels for a lot of days. Um, we hiked all the way up here along this ridge and all the way up. Um, and of course, we had um, dog friends with us this time too, um, because apparently they don't have anything else to do. Um, but uh, this is looking across, and then uh, everywhere around you now is really, really cool to view. Um, this is looking down some of the fields they have started growing, we think, potatoes. Um, Have that on the peak again. I zoomed in a little bit. Um, and I believe that the peak we hit was this is the ridge along here, and we were right behind it. Um, and there's the again, a little bit closer. Um, and then there was our dog friend. <laughs> but, so most of them were, they seemed pretty nice, and you know, they were fluffy coated and happy. But, um, you could see when we were standing up there, um, way down below us. And then this is our lodge here, so we were in this room right down here, um, and there's two sets of them, uh, the room. So. Back again, really, really cool. Um, and then the next day, we started trekking to Lobache, um, which is up above, uh, higher than I had ever been before. Lobache was about the top of the 14ers. Um, and uh, this is our rest stop. We, we stopped here part way through the day. Um, and this is looking back at that peak um, from before. And then uh, a lot of times, because they have to actually carry up the fuel that they use to cook everything, they have these solar heaters. Um, so they'll boil the water in that, and then they'll make rice or whatever with it. Um, so those are pretty interesting. We saw them uh, do it a couple of times while we were there. Um, and then this was, they had, um, I don't know. But uh, they, this is at the memorial site, so partway up this day they have all of these rock um, uh, sculptures or pillars. Um, and this is one of the original um, climbing guides, um, and he summited Everest ten times. Um, he fell down a crevasse on his eleventh time, um, but he summited twice in two weeks um, in 1995. Um, he spent, I forget, uh, I think it was 21 hours on the summit um, of Everest at one point. Um, 
I'm not sure why, but that was pretty crazy. A lot of the time people will spend like 10 minutes up there, um, but somehow we <coughs> were able to be up there for almost the whole day. Um, and then he also has the fastest summit of Everest um, in 16 hours and 56 minutes from base camp to the summit, which is over 10,000 feet elevation. So, yeah. <laughs> but so he's kind of the, the legend there. Um, and then this is looking out, um, this is one of the, the pillars here um, with all the third, third legs. And then this is the uh, one for Scott Fisher, who was one of the uh, people that died in the 1996 um, disaster. Uh, he's one of the, the climbing guides. Um, and that, that's his uh, way there. And then this is when we were hiking farther, and uh, the, the town just behind the bridge over here. Um, but uh, there kept being more and more big mountains all around us. Uh, this is looking across. This is some of the ice fall coming down um, from one of the other peaks. Um, and then we hiked up on this ridge here um, to look down. And uh, this is this is looking down at Little Che. We were staying in the lodge here. Um, and then looking off to the other side, this is the Kumbu Ice Fall. Um, so all of this is moving ice coming down from Everest. Um, Everest is over here, and it's all coming down here in the river. Um, and this is all, all ice that has rocks on top of it. And if you stood there, you could hear it crackling mm -hmm. as it moved, um, which was a little scary. But, um, yeah, so we could sit there and listen to that for a while. And, uh, I also didn't think about it, and I uh, can't wear my sunglasses with my glasses on, and I, of course, didn't have contacts, and um, so that was interesting, because um, either I couldn't see or I had some protection. So, um, <laughs> but then this is we were hiking up um, the last day. This is the camp right before uh, Everest Base Camp, um, where our chef. Um, these are lodges here, and then we were in the only other one. Um, and uh, so it, they're a lot less once you get higher up. I should fix that, sorry. efforts work, or did you have problems with altitude sickness when you got over there? Uh, we actually didn't have, uh, me and Yuri didn't have any problems with altitude sickness. We did bring Diamox, which is the drug that you're supposed to take, um, but apparently it makes you very dizzy, um, which is not a good thing when you're climbing the mountains, and so they told us not to take it, even though they told us to bring it, um, and we actually didn't have any problems. The, the other group that we were kind of climbing along with, um, they were all from sea level, um, and they did the whole thing that we did without taking the climatization days because their helicopter was, they couldn't get the helicopter. Um, they were a day later than us. 
Um, so they did the, the whole thing in five days, we did it in seven, um, and all of them, they actually had a, an oxygenator uh, meter with them. Uh, we were, me and Yuri were at, I think, 70 and 80%, and they were all at like 60% oxygenation. Oh. And anything below, like, 70 is bad. Um, yeah. And uh, so they, they were having some trouble, and they actually got heavily lifted out um, mm -hmm. of one of the higher camps. But they're um, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, so that was the other thing. So we went in off season. So I think the coldest it ever got was about 30 degrees, even on the summit of the peak. Oh. Um, so, yeah. So. Isn't there like a um, spot on Everest that you can reach up to 100 degrees? Yeah, yeah. So because of the, um, the snow, it gets really hot actually when they're climbing a lot of it. So on the, the big ice spaces, um, it, it gets really hot. Um, so they usually actually strip down to kind of what we were wearing. Um, and uh, but yeah, so we were just walking around in kind of our, you know, light layer. So we walked down. Um, you can't even stay there. Oh, okay. So this is uh, the ice wall coming down from over here. Everest is in the background. You can kind of see it. It's this going up here into the cloud. Um, but that's the ice wall. So we're in base camp, and when they climb up it, they go kind of up um, to the side of it, and go up, um, and then uh, camp one is up above here, um, where they start, and then they come up behind here um, to the summit. Um, and then this is ice ball coming down. This is uh, low sea next to it. And then this is looking down, there are these lakes starting to form because everything was melting. Um, and uh, we had to kind of cross across, you know, go around the lakes and stuff um, to get to the big camp. But, uh, and then we walked that, or this is more than I thought. Um, and then there's an avalanche. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we saw, so this is pictures because I didn't have a camera to, to go for a while. Um, but, uh, so that was interesting um, to hear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, family is it? <laughs> So then we walk down to the ice fall, um, and uh, so we're this is looking at Everest is behind here, um, and there was this nice river running down that actually made a nice cold breeze as we were going, um, and yeah, so uh, that was pretty interesting looking up at all the ice. The ice was maybe eight or ten feet above you, um, so it uh, melted down. Uh, but we we wanted to go touch it just to say we could or we had, um, but we couldn't get across that river because it was about six feet wide everywhere we looked. So, um, but yeah, it was still really cool walking down. And we left our guide up um, at base camp so we could see where we were going back because it all looked the same. Um, so <laughs> we didn't want to get lost. And then this is looking, you can see there's two rainbows here um, because of the atmosphere. Um, there's the second one, so the sun's just above here. Um, and so that was pretty cool. We could see it really, really visibly. Um, in between the peaks there. And then this is zooming in on both teams, one of the, the um, cracks here forming, kind of like a crevasse, I guess, but um, this is zoomed in a lot. Um, but we go back one time. Um, so that's this right here. Okay. So, and I assume that's something crazy, like um, 30 feet deep or something, but it, it was pretty thick. So, you can see the rainbow there again, and more of the ice fall. Bam. So, this is one of the parts that we crossed. This is on the way back, but there's cliffs kind of on both sides going down the lakes. Um, and this is ice, which is covered with sand, which shouldn't really make it any more helpful. Um, and uh, so this is when we're trying to get back across it, um, and uh, it was super slippery. Um, and, uh, 
<laughs> but uh, from here, it, this is actually the coldest part of the trip. Um, and I mean, we were going pretty high, um, but it actually started snowing when we got to the top up here. Um, and it was all rocks, and so it was super slippery. Um, and we did have another dog that was following us up the whole way up that. Um, and so this is when we got to the top, looking back down, that's the ice fall. Um, and these are some of the rocks down here. But the, the whole thing was like a rock slope. Um, so what kind of a shoes did you have to vary into the shoes? Uh, for here, we just used, uh, we had hiking boots on the whole time, except for when you were climbing the peak. Uh, those boots that I have in the back we used, um, just when we put on the crampons and everything. Um, so when actually we were hiking up to climb the peak, I also wore my hiking boots when we switched into the other the warm boots when, only when we got to the snow. Um, oh. and, uh, yeah, so. mm -hmm. so this is Jerry coming up. You can see it's, that, that snow wasn't all there when we got it, as we walked up. It, it was kind of um, going, um, and then they have a <coughs> thing, uh, or weather system up there. Um, So and this is looking out over the ridge on all the curve flights that are there. And this was a post, I guess this was up at some point, but it fell over. Um, Did you have wind every day all the time? Uh, it actually wasn't really windy most of the time, which was, I guess, unusual, our guide told us. Um, when we were up here, uh, it was pretty windy. Mm -hmm. and uh, But it actually calmed down when we were on the top of Island Peak. There wasn't a lot of wind. Um, so it was, it was pretty windy also at Everett's base camp. When we were actually at the base camp when we walked down. Like that. So. Uh, there's our daughter, Brad. She was very happily following us all the way up. She actually beat us up. Chasing up, and they would run, and they would jump onto the, all over the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
Probably because we have tied feet and claws. Yeah. Are those generally strays? Yeah, yeah. So most of them. There was only one dog that we ever found that actually had an owner. Um, and so this is back at the cone, which we walked through on the way to Ever Space Camp. Um, and they were actually remodeling the lodge that we were in. Um, it used to be um, the guy's house, um, but because there's always a need for more rooms, he, uh, I think, built another room somewhere else, and he's turning it into the lodge, um, adding rooms for people to sleep in. Um, and so they were redoing all of this, and uh, this was one of the guys that was working all the stuff they do, of course, by hand. They carry out the two by fours, the porters. I think it was about 10 two by fours per porter. Um, and that's the only way to get anything up. Um, and uh, like the, the roofs on the houses, all that, they carry up. Um, and I think there was, I think four sheets was the max we were saw anybody carrying up the roofing panels. Um, but then he had just a chisel and he would chisel away and that's how they would connect them when they had uh, nails. Um, but they didn't have any power tools uh, until we, I think at Namche was the, the highest place they had power tools that we saw. Um, and then this is starting back down to face camp, so we went back down to Dingboche, um, and then uh, up. Um, so that was that was an interesting thing. Um, 
and uh, I feel pretty bad about that, um, and very not that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it worked out in the end, and I, I mean, I, we had drinking tea before that, and um, I drank my other bottle of water before we left, so I, I was somewhat hydrated. Um, you want to try it with this one? So this is, um, uh, this is when we were climbing up, um, and this is actually, we partnered with one guy from the other crew, um, who was from Hong Kong, um, and he had his own climbing guide and him, and then it was us three, our, our climbing guide and me and Yuri. Um, this is him coming up when we were hiking, um, and so there were all these slippery rocks again, and we were hiking up, and of course it was pitch black, so we left about 1 a.m. Um, and when we went back down, it was really scary when we hiked up, because um, there was like cliffs on both sides, and, but we had no idea, but we, any, we couldn't see anything. Um, so, so we just followed the climbing guys, and then it started snowing then too. Um, so then this is once we uh, changed into our, all of our um, dry gear, and we put on our boots, and we got all of our ice axes and stuff, and, um, and we started hiking up, um, and so it's me up there in the middle, and then our guys up front and then the other guy, he took this picture of us. Um, and uh, so we, we walked up here um, and then I was looking down at them. And this is the view part way up. Just a little hike. Yeah. <laughs> so th th this part was, we didn't, I didn't have any problems with the altitude. Uh, but of course, it was hard to breathe. So you would, you know, take a couple steps, um, and then and then wait a little bit and kind of get, catch your breath again. Um, and uh, the one interesting thing was that you, when you drank some water out of your hydration bladder, uh, you would you would you'd take a sip, and then you might have to catch your breath um, because you weren't breathing while you're drinking. Um, mm -hmm. Normally, that's not a problem because you were so oxygen deprived. It, it was really annoying every time because you almost started hyperventilating every time you drank water. Um, <laughs> but, uh, what time yeah. is this now? What time? Oh, uh, this was probably about uh, 6 in the morning. Um, so we had been hiking for a while and um, we had just gotten to the, the part where we put on all our gear was just after sunrise. So then this is hiking up um, and our, the, the guy who took the picture before, he's way up at the top there. Um, this is our guy. And uh, you would, usually when you're walking, you'd have your ice axe and you kind of look at the ground where you're hiking out, and you look up and they'd be way ahead of you. And you're like, oh my god. And then you'd like look down and you're like, I'm going to get to them. And then you'd get up to where they were and you'd look up and they'd be way ahead of you again. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> they just run up the hill. Uh, so, and then we got to the crevasses, which we didn't know were there, um, which was interesting. And uh, so this is them uh, setting up the ladder. Uh, it was buried under the snow here. Um, and they have some anchor points that are set. Um, and then this is actually three ladders that are lashed together. Um, but they, they would they set it up and they would slowly drop it across the crevasse. Um, and the other guy, um, he's actually an ice doctor. Um, so in the ice fall on Everest, he's one of the guys that goes and sets all of the ropes and ladders all the way up it for the Everest climbers. Uh, I think there's about 25 of them each year. Um, he has a jacket and everything. That, but he was always wearing backpacks, so I never got a picture of it. Um, but so he's pretty experienced with those. Uh, so that was, that was pretty nice. Um, so there's that, I mean, we're setting on the ladder. We actually had to do across two crevasses using the same ladder. So we went across one, we grabbed the ladder, and we all carried it up to the second one and then laid it across again. Um, and then this is me going across the second one. <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriend. <laughs> 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 yeah, so yeah, I had my crampons and I would kind of clip the, the, the spikes into the ladder there in between two of the runs. And uh, we clipped the tail if we were actually seeing the bottom or just kind of curved around. Um, but yeah, it, it was pretty deep. So Xander Richard Mom seen this? Yeah, that's why I took this video. He <laughs> <laughs> almost started crying. <laughs> It was interesting. 
And they didn't tell us we were going to do that, so it was definitely a surprise. Um, <laughs> and Xander, is that what you use there? Oh yeah, so this is, while we are planning, this is going across just for safety. We were actually clipped on. I have uh, my ascender on one side and my carabiner clipped to the other rope, um, so there was no way I could really fall. Um, but so this is the ascender. Um, so this would clip into the rope, uh, it unlocks here, and you clip it in. It has really scary spikes on here. Um, and uh, so when you clip it in, you can push up, but when you pull down, it locks into the rope. So that's how we were climbing up uh, without falling back down, because um, there's six lines almost all the way up um, on the feet. So, yeah. so uh, this is what we climbed up. So there's a fixed rope coming all the way up here. Uh, this is the other guy again. He climbed up and cleared all the snow off the ropes before us. So this is me down here waiting. Um, and we had clip in with our ascenders, and this is almost vertical going up. Uh, we actually didn't go along the ridge line of the mountain, we went straight up the side of it, which also we didn't know we were going to do, but apparently that's the fastest way. <laughs> but of course, we didn't really speak English, so we're not quite sure why we did that. <laughs> You're like, okay. It, it, was, it was challenging, but I, I quite liked it. Um, I think it was more representative of what you do on a bigger mountain. Um, and then this is the summit here, uh, before we cleared off the, the road. Or there's no off the road going up to the top. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, and there was, I was already on the top, and this is looking down at Gary, who was coming up the last little hill. And of course, uh, that, that previous picture, when he's looking down at us, you get up to the top of that, and it's, it's perfectly vertical at the top, and you get yourself finally over the edge, right? And then there's a bunch more mountain ahead of you. <laughs> and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> but we finally made it to the top, um, and uh, we stuck together for the most part. Um, and uh, I would usually go ahead and then I would stop and kind of take a breather um, and wait with the, the guy there. Um, was Yuri a Russian? No, he was Slovenian. Yeah, yeah. oh, so yeah. And what temperature are we talking? Uh, so this is warming up again, so it was probably 30 or 40. Um, and it wasn't actually that windy, which was really nice. Um, so we carried all of our puffy gear out um, and then never wore it. Um, oh, okay. And yeah, so then this is us on the top, so um, that's Gelgen, who's the other. Um, the other guide, um, and Ramsey there from Hong Kong, and then that's all of us and our guides there in the back. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, of course, none of us, me and Ramsey and Yuri, didn't think to wear sunscreen because it was midnight when we left. Oh, so yes. all of us got our faces totally burnt. Um, and my nose actually blistered and started oh. losing stuff on the way down. So that was a <laughs> Um, but uh, it was a little underwhelming when you got to the top because you couldn't see anything. It was just white. Um, but you thought you were doing something cool. Um, and it felt hard. Uh, but it was pretty challenging going up. But I mean, luckily, because I didn't have problems with the altitude, uh, it, it was just you know kind of slowly going and going more, um, persevering through it. Um, and uh, you know, we had first aid stuff and whatever in our backpack, but we didn't have to use that. Um, and when we got to the summit, our guide uh, called his wife and said hi and told her that he was on the summit. And so, yeah. so what, what so time did you guys summit? summit? What time did you guys summit? Uh, we summited at about 9 o'clock. So it was about 8 hours of climbing. Um, okay. And then we went down in about 5 hours, I think. Um, so, but yeah. So, and there is, there's cell service almost all the way up um, most places you go, which is pretty interesting. So that was a kind of fun shot. And this is actually, um, Gelgen has a selfie stick with a Bluetooth remote, and so he stuck it in the ground, <laughs> pointed at us, and then he would take pictures of his little clicker thing, um, which was pretty cool. Um, but, yeah. So, uh, so you all have hard pads? Yeah, yeah. So well, actually, yeah, the, the guys, Gelgen wore his when we were climbing, but he took it off in the summit. Our guy didn't wear a helmet at all, um, which, you know, a little interesting. But, uh, and uh, most of the time they didn't wear gloves either, um, and they didn't use their ice axes at all. Um, our guy actually didn't, like, hold his ice axe. He had it in his backpack, and the only time he used it was to chip away at ice. He didn't actually climb with it, he just walked up the hill with no hands. Um, and he also didn't use an ascender most of the time. He just had a carabiner clipped down. Uh, mm -hmm. for the safety line. So. Then did, did did you um, have training, ice climbing training before you went? 
Well, so I did training, um, I had been ice climbing, and I also did training um, not with an ascender, but with ice axe and crampons, and learning how to stop yourself if you slide on um, one of the 14ers with a different guy in the company. And Yuri had done it before on the Alps. Um, but Ramsey from Hong Kong had never been climbing before, um, and they didn't really teach him a lot. They told him how to hold the ice axe, and we we did we practiced. They had a rope set up down at base camp um, that we practiced with the ascenders going up and how to clip in. And you're always you have the, the safety carabiner which is clipped to your harness, and then uh, the, the ascender clipped to the other side. And you would clip um, the when you got to a point where the rope was tied off, you clip on the safety carabiner and then under your ascender, and then clip it to the next rope, and then under your safety one again. So you're always clipped into something. So we learned how to do that. Um, but I had learned most of the skills beforehand, so they didn't actually teach you a lot. And they also didn't ask us, like, before the trip, if we had ever been on a mountain before. Um, so, but that's kind of the thing there, is that they, they don't have really regulation against it. Um, so that, that was interesting. And I, it was lucky that me and Yuri both knew what we were doing, and we felt safe with each other. Um, so, yeah, so then the, the carabiner clips in through here, um, so the, the rope goes underneath it, so the rope can't fall out either. Um, even if it comes back up. <coughs> this, work. this is a climb down. Oh, you can see a little bit more now. Mm -hmm. so the, the summit ridge going down, and then we kind of went down that base there. Or, Here's where you switch your. Yeah, yeah, so it was about, it depended, but every like 25 to 50 feet, uh, we, we unclip and switch to the next rope. Um, and on the way down from here, because it was relatively level, uh, we just clipped in our safety lines and we grabbed the rope and just used the friction of our gloves to walk down. Um, and then once we got to the end there, where those guys are, uh, we clipped in with our belay devices and rappelled down, um, and uh, which was a lot of fun. I, I like the time, but uh, um, and it was kind of annoying every time you got to one of the tie off points because you had to stop and unclip and then reclip. Um, but, uh, so. so then this is us when we're ascending. <coughs> we're ascending. So. And at one point, uh, my crampon fell off, so that was exciting. Um, the, the toe piece slipped off to the side, and so I had to stop part way down the mountain and slap it back on. Um, and this is the part, there's a little crevasse here, um, and going down, and uh, both Yuri and me, Ramsey, didn't notice I was there, and both fell into it. And then Yuri um, pulled himself out, right? And he just kind of pushed his way up. And they, I mean, they, didn't, they were still propelled, so they were holding themselves. And there's their guy. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they, 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 he didn't have too much of a problem. Um, <laughs> but uh, then Ramsey, who of course, you know, didn't really do climbing, um, he just sat there in the hole, held himself, and yelled for help. <laughs> and just sat there and spun in circles. I, I wasn't there, but I Yuri was watching. Um, and then the guy had to come and haul him out of the hole. Um, and uh, so, you know, <laughs> Well, we all made it down, um, and I, mean, I, I never really felt scared because I knew kind of what I was doing, and the guys, even though they seemed kind of like they weren't paying attention, um, they, they, they really were, and they, they would always, any time we do something wrong or whatever, we didn't put in right, they would automatically stop you and put you in, um, and so I didn't really feel scared. Uh, but so this is looking at it cleared out, so this is the part we walked up here, um, and uh, so there's that. But, uh, and then we walked up um, to the side here. More. But, uh, yeah. so. And this is going back down, looking at some of the, the crevasses below us. Uh -huh. That's the pictures of Skeleton when he was walking back across. And of course, when they, the guides go across, he's coming back, and we have to move the ladder back down to the next crevasse. It's totally unhooked from every, anything, um, because he unclipped it on that side. And so the other guy was holding it here. And, uh, and he just, you know, runs across it also. Um, and uh, so, yeah. But, uh, and this is looking down the part where we came up. And looking out over, so this is Everest. Or not Everest, uh, I think this is the, the ice ball, I'm not sure. Um, 
But, and Everest, even if at the top of Island Peak, it loads you in your way, so you can't see Everest. Um, but we didn't get to see either. But, uh, and then this is uh, some of the, the ice coming down when we, we have to change back into our boots and then we hike down here. Uh, this is the lake here that the researchers were taking measurements on. Um, and then we hike back down uh, to Namche. Um, there are some of these houses here, which were kind of the, the, the farmer's houses. Um, and as we walked down, we could see that they were slowly, they would put on burlap, uh, like bags. Um, I'm not sure if they did it all the way or just in the top. So there's actually the, the, the sheet metal underneath. And then they laid, laid like the shale pieces on top. Um, and I'm not sure if that's for cooling or for the rain, I assume. Um, during the modern food season, but as we went down, there was a bunch of houses that had now have rock roofs on them, uh, which is interesting. Um, and then this is the crew from Namche Bazaar. A lot of the families there, they get uh, a donation kind of from the, the government. People will, will fund it. Um, and they go and they walk all the way up and down the trail and clean up the trash. Um, and they get free lodging and stuff as they go up and free meals. Um, so we ran into them three times, I think. There were a couple different groups. Um, and uh, so that was pretty cool. And, uh, we saw one of the the wife of the innkeeper at Namche. We met her along the way too. Um, and this is back down on the way at, uh, in Tangoche. So this is the, the Buddhist monastery here that you can see in that one picture when you're looking way across. Um, and we weren't allowed to take any pictures inside, um, but we walked 